you stop looking for something and it pops up. Kindred souls. Have you ever come across characters who seemed more prominent than they actually were? Or for some reason to you, they seemed like they were just more important. Somehow they managed to leave an impression on either you or the public in general, or so it seemed. Something far larger than their actual presence. And then of course, some people have probably never heard of them. Query and Echo are some such characters to me. No, not Quiz and Query, Query and Echo. Or Query and Probe or also Quiz and Quiz, will explain the names. They're the female hench duo of the Riddler. They're fascinating because what there is to know them has been pieced together. Details added on later on the timeline slotted backwards to make things flow in a kind of narrative fashion, forming something coherent out of the ether. This explains just how they came to be working with slash for the Riddler. Before Rebirth came along and made it weird, or not weird, but rather much less complex. Although that whole Batgirl prelude to the wedding issue is, an experience. Would you like to play a game? So just who are Query and Echo? Well, let's take a trip back to the late 80s, but mostly the 90s and the early 2000s and find out. Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from these comics new and old, to history, to anecdotes, to really wherever our women's take us. Riddler sidekicks, an oddity, and also apparently something with a shallow naming pool. The name Quiz was recently reused in 2021 in Legends of the Dark Knight for a character who was marketed as the Riddler's punchline. It was a daily digital exclusive comic thing, if we learned at the radar for a lot of people. As for Query and Probe, their first appearance, what is cited as, starts their journey into being hard to pin down. It is given a secret origin special number one. This is 1989 by Neil Gaiman. The art in the Riddler section, as the story is divided into parts, is by Bernie Mario. This for pencils. And it's these two who are given creator credits. The framing device of the story is that a shady reporter named Steve Jones is looking to make a name for himself. He wants to film a sensational documentary in Gotham humanizing the villains. And he manages to score some interviews of whom the Riddler is one. In this story, it's further forward in the timeline, and so the Riddler is much older. He's also paroled and works in a junkyard, cuz. In this story, the Riddler is reminiscing about how fun the good old days were when he pulls out a photo. This is me with Query and Probe. As you can see, the photo is blurry, hard to make out. There's a passing resemblance to their layer designs, but not too much. They could be any woman, really. And that's it for that story. It's barely a moment, a blip, a blink and you'll miss it. To so the point where part of me feels if maybe their first appearance should be credited as one of the later ones. But the thing is, they're going to appear several times in 1995 with different names and different appearances. But their first actual major appearance is in Detective Comics Annual Number 8. This by Chuck Dixon with art by Kieran Dwyer, who is both on pencils and inks. The colors are by Richmond Lewis. This story is a very Riddler outing. An examination of the Riddler's psyche as well as a light retelling of some of his origins and moving past it. One of the things it highlights is a general through line for the Riddler of not being overly liked within the villain community. Yes, he is one of them, but not overly popular. This story plays with the idea that he had a hard time getting henchmen because it was a hard sell to people that he was going to deliberately leave clues slash riddles at scenes to bait the cops and Batman. He can't find anyone until he himself is held up at gunpoint while trying to rob the same store. You stop looking for something and it pops up. Kindred souls. These SM looking biker chicks are Query and Echo. There's no mention of the probe name. But the credit seems to travel backwards because whenever you see any two women with Eddie, they're just attributed to being these two. Any two women must be those two women in the photo. Must be these women here. It just must be some variation of these women. Such is the logic based on how their appearances are identified. In this story, we get to see a lot more of them. The three click and they become his loyal henches and genuinely enjoy his crimes. And the fact that they got to keep rocking those fishnets. Query and Echo were eager accomplices. If on the wild side. Ready, girls? We were born ready, Eddie. There is a definite eye candy element to Query and Echo. They're hard to get a read on because they don't really have much in terms of personality. They're wild, violent, fearless in terms of pulling off their crimes, and extremely confident in presenting themselves in a sexual and alluring manner. But outside of that, they are very much minor side characters. Though it is noteworthy that the Riddler trusts them implicitly, and they seem worthy of that trust. It's a bond, almost a Silver Age level bond between Hench and Boss. They just seem to be having fun, but there were still a lot of questions about them. Following this outing, they are utilized sparingly, and the majority of occurrences or big occurrences are by Dixon. In 1995, the same month as that annual, there is a story Batman Riddler, Riddle Factory. This one by Matt Wagner, with art by Dave Taylor, where the Riddler decided to be the Joker and hijack a TV show and force people to answer riddles. In this story, he has two female sidekicks, but they don't look like Query and Echo. Instead, they appear to be twins sporting matching high ponytails. But because the history of these two is so loose, they still get credited as Query and Echo, or as Quiz and Query, which is the better name combination. Since assumedly Query meant mentions that Quiz is coming at one point during this story. These are also the names, Quiz and Query, that are given to their DCAU counterparts, who bear the same look but with a darker skin tone. Neither the changing looks nor the changing names are rationalized in canon, but in fanon they bother to give an explanation for the names, just saying that she changes them on a whim. 
because why not? I can't talk. Hashtag wig life. In December of 1995, in Batman Chronicles number three, in the story The Riddle of the Jinx Sphinx by Doug Muntz, this version appears once more, still firmly called Quiz and Query and apparently being twins. In this story, they act a bit as muscle, not just back up with guns, and they talk to Eddie a bit about how they approve of him aiming his riddles at victims rather than cops. They say it's an improvement. It also makes his crimes go better because the people can't solve them. In this, they admire him, but they also talk as equals. They seem to be on very friendly terms. But things start to fall apart when the Riddler cracks because he needs the attention of baiting authority with riddles. There's a really good secret origin of Zaz story in here as well, in case you were looking for that. As to the recognizable Query and Echo, they play a decent role in a three-story arc also in Detective Comics beginning in issue 705, this by Chuck Dixon. In this story, they stage an elaborate breakout of the Clue Master at the Riddler's behest, while he simultaneously escapes from the hospital. The Clue Master then has a bomb vest attached to him with a very painful looking crotch strap as part of it, and he's sent to Batman and Robin, who then have to run around solving riddles or he'll blow up. All of course is a distraction from the Riddler's true attempted crime. It's a solid story, and you get to see Batman, Robin, Tim at the time, and Oracle all flexing their various expertise to solve these riddles. Query and Echo do what they did in the annual. They kind of round the Riddler out a bit, but on their own, not entities. They would also appear again over in the Robin series, again under Dixon. This is issues 93 and 94. Dixon did a significant amount of work establishing Tim at the start as a viable solo character. Query and Echo show up here in their civilian personas, which are biker chicks. They're seen living together, and then later they end up crashing at Stephanie Brown's house, spoiler's house, while her father, Clue Master, is living there. They're just kind of there. They're rude and a bit rough, and once more, they're fiercely loyal to Eddie. Following that, they would bounce around and be used very sparingly. Sometimes they would be seen without the Riddler, but still in their Riddler henching costumes. Guess they're just that good. In Nightmare, they're working for Sly Fox, but mention they like working for Eddie, as they call him, and that he's not so grabby. Which introduces an interesting dynamic, which will start to be fleshed out, and then again, just be cut off for something more generic in the Rebirth era. In Birds of Prey 74, under Gail Simone, Huntress and Black Canary use their personas to go undercover, and one of them seems to be going as one of the Riddler's side Sidekicks. If you check the description, it will say that they're going as both, but only one is dressed in any kind of Riddler outfit. They're going undercover to a meeting where hence people are trying to start a union. It may be a case of one being misattributed because they're so close in proximity, or one is just dressed differently, like they changed their costume because again, nobody knows anything about them. If one wasn't in the know, they could just be dressed as generic hence people. Also, Query and Echo are never named. At least their names never mentioned out loud, but they have them. They are Deidre Vance for Query and Nina Damfino for Echo. After that 2004 kind of reference, maybe if one can call it such, they've vanished physically until 2018, which was a very different time for DC Comics. Several crises had passed in the meantime. In 2011, the entire universe had been rebooted, but several of the changes had not been the best received, and so the universe had been soft rebooted again in 2016, which began the Rebirth era. One last detail before we hop there, a mention. This in Detective Comics 822 in 2007 under Paul Dini. This was during the reformed Riddler arc when Eddie was a private detective. He's working with Batman in this story, and he takes him to an s &M club called Pandora's Box, and he says that this is where he recruited Query and Echo, contradicting their annual appearance, but definitely explaining their wardrobe choices in that panel. Now let's hop back over to the Rebirth era. Batman under Tom King made much to do about the idea that Batman and Catwoman were gonna get married. Of course, with marriages being out of vogue time of recording, and for some years prior, it was always a long shot. But DC really began to hype up the idea that it was actually going to happen. Spoilers, it didn't happen. And then Tom King did marry them in a black label, elseworldly, but also finishing his run something over in Batman slash Catwoman several years later. Before the wedding, which was meant to be in issue 50, there were several tie-in issues leading up to it, called Prelude to the Wedding, and one such was Batman, Prelude to the Wedding, Batgirl versus the Riddler. This is during the Burnside era of Barbara Gordon as Batgirl, where she was slightly de-aged and at the start of the arc severely dematured. Barbara was a senator once. A senator. Never forget. This Prelude outing was by Tim Seeley, with pencils by Ming Kyu Jung and Otto Schmidt, inkers Jose Marsden Jr. and Otto Schmidt. Colorist Jordi Belair. Batgirl finds a Walkman with a cassette in it, asking her if she would like to play a game. The Riddler is Jigsaw now. She even has to go around and solve these riddles to save people before they die in these horrible, elaborate kind of trap things. Or just really bad deaths. The Riddler in the New 52 era has a different backstory. It's more tied into Wayne Enterprises. He also has a history as a software engineer. So why is he messing with Batgirl? Well, it also ties back to Query and Echo. Eddie is monologuing at Batgirl on these tapes, just rambling. And if she beats the riddle, she finds a new tape. It's like the Arkham games, only he's not actively watching her. He's leaving a lot to chance. What if she solved nothing? That would be a very different story. Also, it would involve a dead child at that point. That'd be very sad. So she's listening to these tapes and then things just get uncomfortable. There's something about you that puts me at ease, Batgirl. I feel comfortable enough to discuss my past, specifically my history with females. I know that sounds clinical and distant, but there have always been women in my life. I have money as much as I want whenever I choose to take it. I have power 
I hold all the answers. I miss awkward Riddler. This Riddler is icky. Because of this, some woman found me attractive. A certain type of woman anyway. Is anyone else getting undertones from this narration being paired with Batgirl fighting Query and Echo, who at this point have been categorized as some form of sex worker? It feels dismissive or judgmental of them, and really downplays and ignores some of the fun bond that was shown between the characters in early appearances, as brief as they may have been. It may not have been intentional, but the two things working in tandem together create a certain energy. It also undercuts the idea that one of the things the woman liked about working for Eddie was that he didn't view them in a predatory or salacious way. They were touching him in some panels, and you could for a sexual relationship if one wanted, but they also touched everybody just in the panels that they were shown. They were just kind of touches. Also, not all touching has to be sexual, it could have just been a closeness. There are some who had canned the Riddler is on the asexuality spectrum, though not necessarily a romantic, but possibly. That could have been interesting and a less explored dynamic. Back to what 2018 gives us. And I suppose that I was attracted to them for a while, in a way. Simple animal urges, raw physicality. Oh! But he goes on, there is no love after the sex, and after talking to the Joker, who has been going on and on about this Batman wedding, he discovered something about himself. He's discovered he is a sapiophile, attracted to intelligence. That's why he's decided to go after Batgirl, who he somehow knows is a powerhouse of intelligence. Is not any first date truly really the same? Two gladiators facing off, assessing one another, circling each other. Wouldn't this make more sense if he was pulling it on Batman? He already has more of a history with him, and they've matched wits several times. He knows how intelligent he is. He likes to bait him specifically. It could recontextualize his obsession, to himself at least, and it would tie in better with the whole, oh no, Batman's getting married theme. Why Babs? How in this timeline did he pick her? She's not Oracle here, so while she has a good reputation, it's not necessarily overly standing out over anybody else. Is it just for easy built-in discomfort since she looks so much younger than him? That will give us some private time at the end of our date. Some time to get closer, as I can tell you. I believe I could come to love you, Batgirl. <laughs> and if you've made it through this challenge with as much wisdom and cleverness as I anticipate, it is possible, likely even, that I already do. Make it stop. Just like the shirtless, burnt question mark Riddler, make it stop. Although while I was reading this, I had a thought. Let's transfer the story a little bit. Let's warp it. Let's play with timelines. We control the multiverse. Or the omniverse. What if in the story Babs was Oracle? Like classic Oracle. Reel me this. But not really, because it's not a real riddle, but neither are a lot of the Riddlers, so it's fine. The Riddler has a background in software engineering. He becomes aware of this presence in the Bat family who is feeding them intel, answers. It fascinates him. Maybe he's able to tap into their comms at one point during one of his crimes, and he hears Bab solving his riddles. He comes to the conclusion that really, she's the brains of the entire operation. He's intrigued. Who is this woman? She seems like a ghost. She's not out in the field. She's different than the others. She's not out there using her fists. He could feel a kinship, maybe come to think that she's an outsider like him, which would play well with him feeling left out of the villain community. Maybe he can feel that she feels the same way about the Bat family. He can imprint all these ideas and hopes onto her, and then you could follow through with the setting up an elaborate series of riddles, and then at one point she actually has to physically go and he's waiting there for her to woo her. It would still be misplaced and unwanted, but it would have more depth. At least I think. Let me know what you think. It would definitely be less salacious for salacious sake. And she could still reject him and kick his butt, because Babs in a wheelchair can still kick your butt. Remember when she took out Lady Spellbinder with a stick? Good times. I just feel like that version gives him more of a reason for the obsession, rather than this one, where it just feels a bit more like filling time because we need a Batgirl prelude to the wedding issue. In this story, she's fighting him while still listening to the tapes. Those are some solid headphones. Mine come off if I sneeze too hard. I'm irredeemable, left with no path, save the one I am on, without end, like a ring. What? Like love. Imagine sitting and recording this. Anyway, she beats him and saves his last victim, and then he just vanishes. Oh, and she beat up Query and Echo, and they didn't even get lines this time. When you're treated better while dressed as a BDSM biker, the Query and Echo story. So time of recording, there are Query and Echo. Their early days have kind of been cobbled together. This by fans into a loose chronological canon. It smooths over the edges, even in places where some things contradicted. The cobbling goes as follows. They worked at Pandora's box, yes. They left to pursue a career as criminal biker chicks. They met Eddie while pulling the heist in the store. I've used this panel so many times this video. From there, they proceeded to work for him while he's available, but will pull other jobs for others when he's not. It had also been shown that they would try and break him out, 
but not of things we're gonna get too, too crazy. Like at one point a ceiling shattered and they were like, nah, he's not worth getting glass in our hair. And Probe was Echo's first name and she changed it for reasons. I get it, but it doesn't roll off the tongue. Quiz and Query really is the superior name combination, though they're pretty silent when they appear in the DCAU. Just there with guns and in Santa costumes in that one issue. There is a potential interesting dynamic to be mined between Query, Echo, and the Riddler, or even between Query and Echo. Maybe not worthy of a great and lengthy arc, but probably more than what was given. A few more snippets, maybe. The idea of kindred spirits, people finding each other when on the surface it doesn't seem like they should have anything in common is appealing. The Riddler doesn't have many friends, so it would be neat to play more with a couple of characters floating around out there who actually like him. I would like him not to be a disaster. Of all the depictions, the Rebirth one is the least compelling since it places them in very worn and cliched territory. Of generic sexy female henches and them with their boss while their older depictions hinted at something more complex, or at least more fun. Query and Echo, who are together, or not necessarily, or just really close, but you could also go the together route. It wouldn't need to be thrown in one's face all the time, but it could create a unique dynamic to be mined. At the very least, it's nice to see recurring background characters. They make the universe feel more full. Query and Echo always seem to be having a good time when they were pulling crimes of the Riddler, and if there's one thing comics could always use, it's more fun. But that is the tale of Query and Probe, Quiz and Query, Query and Echo, time of recording. Tell me your thoughts on this hen duo down below. Were you aware of them? What did you think of them? Did you like their dynamic with the Riddler or did it not interest you? Which era was your favorite? Was it the Rebirth one? Do you like seeing them utilized in that way to make the Riddler appear more sleazy? Tell me all your thoughts down below and while you're down there please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking this time day I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.